there has to be a very good reason to introduce a new hip implant. A Me Too copy is not good enough. The BHR was introduced in 1997 after six and a half years of pilot studies. Only three surgeons were initially allowed to do the BHR. Then more surgeons were trained, a register was set up, and longitudinal RSA, metal iron, and DEXA studies were begun. DEXA was done in Osaka University, and the BHR shows an increase of 13% in bone density in Zone 7 at two years. The BHR is the only implant that gains proximal bone density. The worst stress shielding was from the short stem custom. This is potentially very serious because if a patient with a short stem hip gets profound stress shielding, it only takes one stumble for them to get a periprosthetic fracture, whereas we know this is not the case with traditional length stems. RSA showed 0.2 millimeters of migration on the cup at two months and no further migration to five years. RSA on the femur showed no migration. The first 5,000 cases done by 141 surgeons in 44 countries showed a 95.2% implant survival at 10 years. There have been some very disappointing results from hip resurfacing and the procedure is now in sharp decline. For the last five years I've been working on a polyethylene cup resurfacing and I will speak about this in the resurfacing section. Large-headed metal-on-metal total hip replacement became very popular because of the extremely good range of movement and near zero dislocation rate. This patient did well for several years, but at seven and a bit years, there's loss of calcar and loss of teardrop. At revision, milky fluid, no abnormal bearing wear, but severe loss of metal from the taper. The pattern of loss of metal from the taper suggests toggling of the taper in the sleeve. This speaks to the need for a longer taper. This study of 231 modular junctions showed that the stiffer the neck taper complex, the less corrosion. This patient did well apart from intermittent attacks of groin pain which took about a month to settle. The design of this head means that the psoas tendon can catch on the edge. So we have redesigned the head with no lip and a rounded edge on the inframedial side. This is what it looks like, but the manufacturers want me to go to a symmetrical design, which is easier to manufacture. I'm not happy with that because there's a lot of loss of metal in the head posterolaterally. Inflection, large heads tension the posterior capsule. When a lot of the periphery of the head is removed, then that detensions the posterior capsule and these joints may start to dislocate. I've shown you that the head is wrong and the taper is wrong. Now I'm going to show you that the stem is wrong. I have no antiversion on the stem and the tip is hitting the posterior aspect of the femur. With a normal resection level and using a popular flat taper, that is the amount of antiversion that you can get. But there is three degrees of recroversion. With a more aggressive neck resection, there is still a camel's hump of bone in the posterolateral femur. You have to go to a very aggressive neck resection level to get out of that anatomical constraint. And I'm not happy to do that. This is another patient. Four degrees of antiversion are possible. I want to introduce you to the CT stem, which is tapered towards the lateral edge. Here, 11 degrees of antiversion are possible. With rotation around an axis through the medial center, 12 degrees of rotation are possible within the envelope. There's that x-ray again. There's the CT stem in place with no antiversion. I'm now going to give it 12 degrees antiversion, and I want you to watch the tip of the stem. The neck is still not right. If the anatomy will allow 20 degrees of antiversion, then the neck is now correct. Stem is very conventional in other respects. The red area fits into the flare of the upper femur and some of the greats in hip surgery have utilized that feature. This stem has a medial to lateral taper all the way down the stem. When we look along the load transfer regions, then there is an aggressive positive taper and this is done deliberately to transfer load from implant to bone as proximal as possible. Some surgeons are bothered about curved lines, but those curved trabeculae take compressive load from the head into the proximal femur. Those trabeculae take compressive load from the greater trochanter region into the proximal femur. These trabeculae transferring load from the 
Greater trochanter region into the medial, posterior and anterior femur will be disrupted when we put an implant into the bone. CT stem certainly disrupts some trabeculae. This particular stem disrupts some more, but the final proof will be in DEXA scanning. The compass taper is longer and has a greater diameter than standard total hip tapers. It allows us to dial an offset sleeve. We are testing oxidized zirconium alloy, cobalt chrome and titanium alloy to find out which is the best material for a sleeve. We can increase offset, decrease offset, increase or decrease antiversion. With the neutral sleeves we can get minus 8 heads. Hopefully that will address the problem of long leg following total hip replacement. We're now into a saga of multiple laboratory studies. We will have a slow clinical introduction and we will do longitudinal RSA studies, metal ion studies and DEXA studies to check hopefully for the relative lack of stress shielding. This beautiful model from the Royal Observatory shows the sun at the center and the planets orbiting around the sun. And this concept has been accepted since the 18th century. However, now we understand that the sun actually moves at 72,000 kilometers per hour and the planets spiral in orbit around the sun. So our knowledge of the planets has improved dramatically. Now we need to dramatically improve our knowledge knowledge of the workings of the upper femur and stems that are inserted into it. I thank you.